राजौरी हाथक था पहले साफ जैसे पुष्कर है ना ऐसा ही है था इतनी मानता इतना ही धर्म है इसमें इसको जल को जाके किसी के बीमारी है छीटा मार दो तुरंत ठीक हो जाएगा ये है what happens to the property and how do you work in that space and reclaim that space. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, Flint, Michigan, here in the United States. We're going to talk about water and money in this work and the art. Gurgaon is 
um, I don't know, I'd say probably 40 miles outside of Delhi. And if you guys don't know, Delhi is a very hot, dry place. Um, but what happened is, you know, Delhi is also a very large, large city. And what happened was a group of land financiers called Delhi Land Finance, they made a huge bet that there was going to be more need for real estate space and land uh, close to Delhi, mm -hmm. um, considering that I think the airport is somewhere right around there, the main airport. Mm -hmm. So they bought up all this land in a place called Gurgaon. Mm -hmm. And you know the next slide. And in about 1992, it was you know, our friend uh, Jack Welsh of our General Electric, which really you know, catalyzed this whole growth of what is now being seen as the model of new, the new Indian city. Mm -hmm. um, so in 1992, uh, essentially land was deregulated, completely deregulated in terms of land use. That means the government would no longer say, you can do this, you can't do that. Um, on what is previously all agricultural land. So Jack Welsh kind of set up a gem pact and that kickstarted this land regulation and it kickstarted, you know, essentially multinationals from all over the world setting up shop in Gurgaon um, on the land owned by this Delhi land finance. Essentially they own all the land. It's like it's like Las Vegas essentially. It's like Las Vegas or it's like Dubai. I mean that's how this city has come to be over the past 10 years, and now it's number three in terms of the wealthiest cities in India. And it is the model for new cities that are coming out of the ground. And this is, you know, uh, go to the next slide. This is, uh, you know, a place where it's like, live, live outside of India without actually having to leave India. Uh, experience experience the, you know, the wealth and the, the comforts that you can find elsewhere without actually leaving India. And, and with, with this, <coughs> You know, tremendous development is coming, you know, new cultures. This is, I've spent like a month living in what was called Nirvana country and, you know, people have, you know, Anglo-Saxon dogs with Anglo-Saxon names and they have lots of things like we do here, like Audis and BMWs and, you know, it's this, it's an aspirational culture and it's, uh, it's moving really quickly. So, next slide. So, this is kind of what the process looks like. So, you have hectares and hectares of land that was previously used for wheat and for grains and barley and what is, you know, much like we had here, you know, a very grain-based diet before you go to vegetables and meats and fruits, which obviously require more water, right? So now, because there is much more money, um, they've moved on beyond that, kind of like we did in the, in the process of industrialization. So this is... The, you know, deregulating farmland and letting international capital come in. This is um, what agricultural land, you know, being turned into real estate looks like, essentially. And that's that's what you see all over there. And it's the, the contrast. It's like there's no middle ground. It's uh, it's empty plots of land, and then it's pretty incredible wealth that's being generated. Um, so next one. So we, you know, in our project proposal, we said we would kind of look at how to reconcile some of these ecologies. Ecologies being the ecology of capitalism, right? The ecology of land speculation and real estate development and creation. The ecologies of water management. The ecologies of uh, maybe animals. The ecology of natural landscapes. You know, these are things that are conflicting. Mm -hmm. um, agriculture and, and natural waterways are giving, are being affected and transformed by these human developments. So. Essentially, we were looking for different places that sure. Okay. We were looking for different places that were kind of middle grounds in between these uh, changing ecologies that could be used to you know that were in the middle of the transformation from one to another, and where we could actually carve a space for ourselves to be useful. Essentially, so we looked at different sites, uh, and we found one place called Tigra Village. And Tigra Village, as you can see, this piece of land right here, this was there, you know, for 10 generations, essentially. That was there long before any of this speculative development came about. Um, but as you can see here, all these new high-rise buildings and high-rise buildings there, it's gone from being considered a village and thus rural land to urban land. And its governance system has gone from one of like a township or 
uh, you know, a village governance system to one being part of a city. Uh, it's like imagine a small upstate, you know, New York town that all of a sudden is part of New York City. Mm -hmm. Everything changes, right? So that's, we found ourselves, we found this, this area which is very, very interesting because it's the typical, you know, farmland and uh, agricultural uh, culture and population, but that's being just encroached upon by this new development. So what's happening, we went in there with the idea of we're going to do some organic farming. Let's see if we can introduce organic farming as a way of, um, of allowing farming to, you know, to continue in a more uh, aspirational, um, brand-savvy culture, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so we found Tigger and we started to find some of these farms and people were saying to us, like, maybe you have some solutions. How can we hold on to this land? Mm -hmm. So that in the beginning said, great, you know, great, this is an opportunity for us to actually be effective. Uh, and then we soon, after found out that all the agricultural land has already been bought, it's already gone, it's already been acquired, the government has full power of acquiring any land that lies without, outside of these little villages, any agricultural land, they have the right to buy that land, they give the owners a shitload of cash in their hands, a lot of money. These people in this village are rich in terms of money, and so they have all this money in their hands, and a lot of them go, you know, they go to the, you know, they go to far distances to, to buy new agricultural land. But thus, their education doesn't change, their village structure doesn't change, it's just land is changing. So this is an example of, I mean, this is like a small farm that it's been land banked, it's been bought, the owner's receiving payments, um, and essentially it's just waiting, it's just waiting to be turned into the next uh, development. Next one. So we thought it was really interesting, you know, talking to the people there, this is Narada, this is Sohib, they're, uh, you know, they both work in the fields of social design and um, social entrepreneurship, and so we were working together, and it seemed like a really interesting context. So we started meeting people, just going door to door, and this is uh, this is Yogesh and his father. Uh, Yogesh is 22 years old, so he's living through these monumental changes, and he's experiencing them, mm -hmm. and you know, telling us things like, "I have to, you know, I have to re-engineer my brain. Now I need to be selfish to be part of this new society." You know, like, he's really experiencing these things that his father never did. Um, next slide. So, we started listening to people like that. And Yogesh is actually one of the few people that we're trying to encourage to actually take some, take some action in what they see as, as unjust. So, Yogesh took us down to this, uh, this lake, which is called the, the Baba Ram Mohan Lake. And this lake used to be full of water um, before these developments were made. The developments were made on all the water catchment areas. So essentially water used to flow down into this lake during July, August, and September, which are the months of the monsoon, and that would fill up the lake and that would restore the groundwater. Another context worth knowing is Gurgaon is, there's, it's so, it's very dry. Water levels are about 70, 80 feet below ground and the only way in which they're getting water is through illegal tube wells. There was said to be about 30,000 tube wells, which look like oil drills, drilled right down on the earth, <coughs> deeper and deeper, um, to get water. And as every year, you have to go maybe two or three feet deeper, and that's making it a little bit more expensive. But uh, bottom line is, you know, they can still get a whole tanker full of water for about $4. <coughs> so while water is this huge issue, it's still there. It's not an issue until there's no more. Is $4 and, a lot of money hmm? to them? Is $4 a lot of money? No, it's nothing. It's not on the way up. Okay. It's not, yeah, these people have literally hundreds of thousands of dollars from their land. You know, these are people that are buying up land in the mid mid east, midwest of uh, the U.S. because they can't afford land in New York to put things into context. So it's just, in order, just incredible wealth that's being projected here. It's, it's very, very, very expensive. So anyways, Yogesh took us down to this lake because we were talking about agriculture and he said, well, wouldn't it be great if this could be regenerated? It's always been the regenerator of the groundwater and it's also a very sacred place. People come there as this man is, you know, come there to collect what little water is there because it's a very sacred lake. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think it was like a, a, you know, a holy man seven generations ago went there and built a temple next nearby and essentially made this 
you know, make a myth, a story around this, and it's been a very sacred place since. So it's, it's very sacred to the people. Um, you know, all the, the assets of the villagers still cows and water buffaloes, and they still go there to get water and take uh, water baths. So this is very much like a lifeblood of, uh, of the community. Uh, next slide. So we started then asking more people about, uh, about this lake and the future of this lake and understanding some of the dynamics that are, uh, are governing, governing the future of this lake. Um, we'll go to the next slide. So this is just, we essentially went down to the lake and made a circle and called some people together to, to have a talk. And we quickly realized that uh, it wasn't so much about the future of the lake, and it was much more about the politics and the power that was governing how this village works. Um, case in hand. So this building right here, this was, this is a community center. This is public land, this whole lake. But this was land that was reclaimed or filled in by a couple of the powerful people in the, in the village. And thus they made it their private property. No one was going to challenge them. And they created this building, community center, whatever that means. So that's kind of how things are working here. And that's the probable future for this lake. Um, is that you know the people in power will just fill it up and then claim it as private land and sell it off for money. I mean that's the that's the culture that's being pushed through here. You know that's why you know that's why this place is becoming a city because there's lots of money being made there. And that same culture has been given to them, the government coming to them, giving them cash in hand. So that's what they know. That's what they know is all the money that's there for them. And yet there are all the other people in the village that are also thinking about other things. Like, I'm not, why aren't I a part of this? But it's very much suppressed and oppressed by, essentially it's three or four people that have total power over the village. So that's really the issue. We, in speaking people, you know, there's some quotes here, you know, parking here will be a brilliant basement. Um, if we use all the tube wells, you know, who will pay for it. My preference for this is to remain the lake, the pride of the village, right in the center. So we interviewed lots of people, there was lots of opinion, um, and we thought, you know, systematically, analytically, we can do an envisioning, we can facilitate an envisioning event for these people, and we can try to create some sort of consensus, help them come to some consensus as to how this can be restored. Uh, is it going to be filled up with tube water, which is ridiculous. You're essentially drawing water from the ground to just put it back into the lake. Uh, or can there be some sort of rainwater harvesting system to replace the natural water catchment areas that used to exist? Uh, this type of discussion we wanted to have with people at large. Yeah, so it looks to me like this, this actually was a source of life for the animals and the people that yeah. were there, and now it's gone. They, so they're sort of like, gee, how do we deal with it? Yeah, they still say fer no, fertility essentially is a cultural transmission. It's, it's fertility. People would say, now it's dry. And so two women that were in there you know, said simply, um, you know, well, now this is God punishing us for what we've done. The development, you know, the alteration of the ecology, the natural environment. Um, so it's still seen like that, but the money culture is kind of saying, who cares? We can now buy it. You know? So it's very much giving up your resources, and this is where I think the connection also lies, giving up your autonomy for cash in hand. Mm -hmm. And that's also the cyclical thing, as long as there's money in... Well, they don't have a choice, right? They do, they, they, they have a complete choice. Oh, they do. But they don't have a choice in the sense that the decisions are made by two or three, the Brahmins, the most powerful people. Uh -huh. So they have a, a choice, but you know, money is, you know, is ruling, and the decisions are made by three people, essentially. And, and that's it. And so even talking to some people, they'd say, like, why are you asking us these questions? This village is run top down, and we should be doing this top down as well. Yeah. So, you know, it was, it was less about the discussion and more about the politics, unfortunately. Which we tried to sidestep, but it's kind of impossible. Uh, next slide. Um, but so, in thinking of how to try to catalyze something and encourage some other people's ideas and a discussion about what can be done to, to save this lake or how it can be regenerated in a democratic way, we Essentially, I made some land art, so this is like a rain cloud. It's kind of like a, a visualization of what they were saying they'd want to see. So it's a rain cloud, the idea of it being filled up again. 
There's a cow here, uh, because this is a place where all the cows graze. Cows are still seen as the assets. The city, the village, like 60% of people <coughs> have cows and water buffaloes for dairy farming. Um, so they come down there to graze and they come down there to, to bathe. Like this is shallow water and there's shallow water over there. And you know, cows and water buffaloes have been dying in recent years because there's no more water bodies. And it's like 100 degrees every day. And they're either hosing their animals down or they have to find natural water. Or they can overeat and die. And that's what's happening. So we did three visualizations, like a, a swastika, which is just a symbol of to do good, you know, because this is a sacred lake. Um, just, you know, um, the cow and then the rain cloud. And then two words in the middle, which amount to, from, like, from land ownership to responsibility. And that's trying to visualize words they've been saying. It's like, yes, we have cash in hand, but are we doing good for ourselves? You know, we're losing these things, but how do we stop it? You know? Next slide. So if we did that, we also invited people out on a Saturday to uh, watch about 12 minutes of interviews that we've taken from uh, just different people in the community about the lake, the future of the lake. And it's actually brought groups of people in. They would come in, watch the film, and next slide. And then they'd go to the roof where we actually created just uh, like a, a, essentially a gutter, which is an example of how rainwater harvest could work. So next slide. People could essentially just pour water into a gutter that would then run into the lake and you know start to start that conversation of rainwater harvesting. Um, so what did happen though was there was a lot of discussion about the politics about you know why are we doing this? Don't you understand it's, it's political or, or we can't enter into this conversation? So and then you know lots of discourse between people. Next slide. Um, it really became just evident about how much strife there was. Um, but it also did animate some uh, ideas of wanting to, you know, for especially the youth generation, wanting to do um, something positive. Uh, next slide. So we also found out that the three, you know, the, the chiefs, the, the Brahmins who were essentially in charge of the village, they didn't show up uh, largely because they had scheduled their own development meeting at the same time. Um, we thought, you know, perhaps to make sure that no one important came to the meeting. Um, so, and that in turn kind of made it unofficial, and I think they, I mean, clearly they were kind of laughing at the fact that we were trying to engage the other people in the village, the lower caste, the lower classes. So, we took the village to essentially the corner of the um, you know, we said if they're not going to come, then we have to take it, take it to them. So, we took it to this corner, we did a projection, next slide, and which, you know, the projection of the same interviews. And essentially then, you know, the village, and then we try to facilitate a large meeting between people of power and, you know, any, everyone else who was there, and just trying to make it as open as possible. And, you know, it got pretty vicious to the point in which people were talking and then pointing to the development leader and saying, you can't do anything because of this guy, and then he's laughing, and they're pointing to other people saying, oh, isn't it funny what, what those villagers think? You know, so it's really just uh, making evident how strong that power structure is. So this is my stopping point when I came back after we had this big event. Um, but then they, the two partners, they went back and they found that there was a, a really strong response. There was uh, a lot of these, especially the youth of 22, 23 years old, they really wanted to do something. They really wanted to come together and, uh, and reclaim some of their power. So that's where we are at right now. I think it was yesterday, they made like a big wrestling pit in the middle of the lake. And it's really just activities to start to take back, you know, at least create some sort of idea that the land also belongs to them, this place belongs to them. So we're just facilitating and encouraging that kind of reclamation of space and land and, uh, and, and yeah, seeing how close we can get them, essentially to a point in which they can envision the lake. Because in the end, there is the government that is there ready to fence off the whole lake and maybe even make an investment in rainwater reclamation, but it's only going to happen if the village lets them. Uh -huh. So that's what your role is partly about, is to help, help put that, make that happen. Yeah, because so we kind of took this middle role, because the government can't go, they can't go near it, because it's, they hate her because yeah. she's not from the village. Yeah. Yet they have total power, 
uh -huh. it doesn't it works opposite as it would here whereas the police would come in and arrest you uh, there it's like they can vote you out of power and there it's really what the politicians do with people in a way say or don't say yeah. which is to me very strange I mean, to think that the lake is public land but that doesn't mean anything anyone can can, can seize it really. there's a lot of corruption and like you know, behind the doors deals going on. Have they? Sounds like here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of like home. Yeah. So that's really where it stands. I mean, and there are, you know, there are rainwater professionals that we're in touch with. And uh -huh. We want to get the project to that point in which before July and August, which are the monsoon seasons, maybe mm. getting a prototype in place, uh, you know, created in part by this village, yeah. make it theirs. Um, and try it in the season and see to what degree it can uh, help fill up this lake naturally. Do they own the land of the lake? Who owns the it's land? It's public land, but that means nothing. Um, you know, it's like no one's going to stop them from encroaching. Like that community center I showed you, that was just uh, just one day there were people that were filling it in, and then there was some development from public funds. So, so that used to be part of the lake, and yeah. then they built it up and turned it into Yeah, that's about, there's like 35 lakes all throughout Durgao, we've all been filled up and, and turned into real estate. Yeah. And then they're bought up by private developers. Mm -hmm. But just like the private developers are also putting in illegal tube wells into the ground to get water. Well, that, that's, that's the real issue because uh, capturing rainwater off the building and, and moving it over to the lowest point, which ultimately was, initially was the lake. Mm -hmm. Um, letting that kind of happen naturally by gravity, which it will, or getting it there and expediting it with a gutter, it's still going to fall um, below ground far than you know showing its face, the water yeah. showing that surface, just yeah. because they're pulling too well. Right. So really, if you want to empower the people with the water, you have to uh, figure out where they're comfortable with regards to capturing the water and using it in a new way, right. you know, as a symbol of what the lake was, but it can't be. Maybe right now. Right, right, right. Yeah. Was there ever a, a point where you got enough? It, you got enough power as a group in the middle of being intermediaries or trying to be intermediaries with the people in power and the and the people of the village, where there was a conflict with you from the people in power because you were having an effective role in actually trying to get the this lake. In this case, it's the other way around. I mean, these people, this village is as corrupt. And as you know, money hungry and greedy as any people up top. How did that make you? I mean, I, it's, I don't want to do the therapy, but how did that make you feel yeah, when you went in there and put your, you know, put well, all this effort? It's frustrating, you know. These, you know, more than a couple of days in which you say, like, let's set fire to this village, you know. It's, it's literally, it's frustrating. You're trying to like serve people, and they're like, and they don't want to be served. They're like, uh, you know, you're having a meeting out there. You know, that's going to cost you. You know, and give you like a price. You know, because it's, you know, and, it, and, it, and it's tough, but it's also because it's just, people are so, so oppressed. And so that in the end is what we can't hold against them, is like, they're so, so oppressed. And it's like a soulless village and kind of a soulless city right now that's just all about money. What's that, the moral, the moral ground of ecology and business is having a problem. <laughs> well, the, the hopeful yeah. thing, the hopeful thing there is, you didn't see it so much in this village yet, but because this is like a capitalism driven city, there are civic groups that are starting to come out and form to demand uh, uh, amenities and spaces that a profit driven process will never provide, you know, like uh, Greenland or park space, you know, or water. It's very clear there that, like, okay, profit will never provide these things that we need. And there are groups that are starting to take, I mean, and it's, I think it's ridiculous. It's like civic groups are starting to clean up after these huge companies that aren't doing this themselves. Wow. And they're making billions of dollars. Yeah. I mean, maybe, maybe American companies are making more money over there than they are in a lot of places here, to put things into perspective. You know? That's changing. This might be a good time to start to yeah. change to what you're talking about. And yeah, let's change the